we want to go ahead and begin uh, our services. So we're asking everyone to come in and let's take our seats. Let's get situated so that we can uh, begin with our spotlight so that we can begin our program today. So this is a special day. This is our publishing uh, Sabbath where we're going to highlight the publishing work today and we have with us uh, our publishing director from the Southeastern Conference who's going to spend this day with us. He'll preach the word. He'll do a workshop this afternoon and we're just excited about what he's going to bring to us today. Uh, we also are excited about the family uh, lunch that we have this afternoon. We pray and hope that everyone has come with the idea in mind that you're going to stay throughout the day and you're going to have lunch with us as we end the program this morning. You'll come over to the Winston Center and celebrate with us there as we have lunch as a family and we fellowship with one another. We invite all of our visiting friends to stay with us, stay stick around with us, and enjoy this day with us as we give God, God, the praise, the honor, and the glory. So at this time, I'm going to bring on to you Pastor Hall, who is the publishing director for our conference, and he's going to share with us in this mission time. Thank you, Pastor Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? How is everyone doing this morning? All right, greet that person next to you and tell them it's good to see you in the house of worship. Because I did hear the pastor, you know, mention that. A lot of folks are still at home, so it's good to be in the house of worship. Amen? Amen. I've asked Sister Scott to uh, put into your hands a little track called a glow track. So if you don't have one, just quickly lift your hand. I only, I'm going to take only a few minutes. But if you don't have a track in your hand, just keep your hand held high until you get one. And I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about a ministry that has been a blessing to multitudes. And it has to do with a little simple track that's going to be placed into your hands called a glow track. Uh, my understanding is that this track has been financed by a gentleman or a family that are multimillionaires. And they've invested money to make sure that these little tracks have been put together so that multitudes can make their way into the kingdom of God. I want to make sure that everyone's Got one of those tracks. So if you see, I still see one or two hands that are going up. There's some hands that some of our children up front here. So make sure our children that they're able to, to get some tracks into their hands as well. All right, we still see one or two hands. All right. So the so the glow track. Um, you can take these glow tracks and put them in a little packet like what you see me have. There's a little package, like a little pouch that they go into, all right? And this is very simple. In fact, once a year, the Southern Union Conference Publishing Department does a major training. And so we have tested out this little glow track to see how it works. So this past year, a group of us got on the bus in fact, two busloads of us, and they were having a Halloween party with costumes in Atlanta, Georgia. And we crashed their party with these tracks. And it's amazing that in a short period of time, we were able to put out thousands of these tracks. And it, it, it's so simple that a little track like this with this pack, you can put it in your pocketbook, you can put it in your jacket pocket, you can put it uh, in a pocket. It, it, it goes somewhere anywhere. And you simply walk up to someone and says, good morning, sir. Got a gift for you. As simple as that. They either accept it or reject it. Now, in this little packet here, you will find a track. This one says, uh, Diabetes Undone. We have a major epidemic in the black community right now with diabetes. Do you agree with me? This is the black community. It's an epidemic. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the materials that we have from the publishing department this evening that's addressing not only diabetes, but a lot of the other ills that are facing our community. In this little track here, a uh, packet, you will find a track that says God's Last Call. 
It has to do with the three angels' message. You have another track in here that talks about where is God when I'm hurting. There's another track in here that addresses a number of other different spiritual issues. And so what we have asked is that churches get these little tracks and at least once a week they can meet some of them who want to do this as a group. You can meet once a week, you can pray, and then you can go out into the community and give out these little tracks. Now, someone asks, okay, what's the benefit for my church? And if I give out all of these tracts, how is my church going to be benefited? Well, I tell individuals that if you look at the size of this little packet, all your church has to do is make up some business cards with your church's name, address, phone number, any other contact information that is needed, and you put that information right in here with these tracks so that when they open up these tracks, if they need additional information, you've got the church's contact information in here as well. Now, my wife is here with me, and during the pandemic, I heard uh, Dr. Mills mention the pandemic. During the pandemic, when the doors of our churches were closed, I was pastoring a district in Ponciana and Coco, and we were still baptizing. Because one of the reasons why we were still baptizing is because we were not going to let the pandemic stop us from doing God's work. So what we did, we used literature, and I'll talk to you more about that this evening. But what we did on a Monday morning, once a week, we had a group of our members who came. They put on their masks, they put on shields, they were different age groups. We even had someone in their late 70s, our first elder. They would meet at the church representing the prayer ministry, the board of elders, the deaconess, and there were several others. And what they would do on a Monday morning, they would come together and pray. And we had a gentleman that's a retired chemist who ran a health food store in Pont Santa at one time. He's a business person. He sponsored literature for the church. So he would go into his own pocket, into his own bank account, buy literature for the church, stamp that literature, and then we did something else in the last two minutes that I have. We put together a card like this, and I will talk more about this this evening. On one side of this card is a picture of our church with all of the contact information. It has the address of the church. It has the church's office number and the Zoom links and all of this other Facebook and, and media information. On the back side of this card, it listed all of the ministries that our church offered in that community. But then we did something else that proved to be a winner. And that is that we said one day in a board meeting that if people call our church office, most of our churches do not have full-time secretaries. So you know what happens. The, church, the, the, the call goes to voicemail. And the bottom line is, in many cases, some individuals want immediate help. So our board voted something, and that is to add to the church's phone, to connect to the church's phone, a cell phone. So I said to them, look, as the pastor of the church, I have a problem keeping up with my own personal phone. I am definitely not going to carry a second phone. So how do we resolve that? We resolve that by having a personal ministries director and his wife, both who are retired. And so they would be the ones that if you called our church on the second ring, if no one picked up that phone, then the call automatically went to the cell phone. And then on the other end of that phone would be a, hus be a husband or wife that would answer that phone and say, this is the Pine Center Seventh Adventist Church, may we help you. On the other end of those phones, sometimes with some individuals needing prayer, in some cases, there were new Adventists moving into that area that wanted to know where is the Adventist church located. Others were calling for food. Others were calling for all kinds of situations because we were in the midst of the pandemic. So what happened on a Monday morning in my, with my last minute, when our group met and they got those books, Steps to Christ, Bible Answers, Great Controversy, Desire of Ages, we would stick this card in each one of those books. Then they would go into the community and stand at the stores and other locations. And when they got our Steps to Christ, Bible Answers, Great Controversy, 
desire of ages, and anyone can do what they did, they would also get information on the ministry of our local church. And my wife here is a living witness to tell you, because she worked as my personal Bible worker through the pandemic, we baptized somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 40 different individuals. And many of them are very much actively involved in the church right now um, through they coming in through baptism and they've continued to do a, an amazing work. We will say more about this card because this is something we've tested it, we've proven it, and it works using our literature. This evening, we are hoping that you will come back after you get a good meal and you need to maybe kind of stay awake a little bit. We'll help keep you awake this evening in our evening workshop as you come back and learn more about publishing ministry and how publishing ministry is winning souls. We will tell you this evening how one great controversy won more than 20,000 people to the message. God bless you. Do we have anyone visiting with us today? If so, will you please stand or just raise your hand so we can see who you are? Anyone visiting with us today? Amen. Amen. Would you like to tell us who you are? Thank you. We're glad to have you with us today. Anyone else? Kalia, Jalea, okay, we're glad to have you with us today, Kalia. I'd like to leave this thought with you. If you are in a valley of decision and don't know what to do or which way to turn, just turn to Jesus. If God could tell Noah how to build an ark, if he could give David wisdom on how to defeat his enemy, if he could tell Esther what to say and do before the king to save her people, if he could make the sun stand still for Joshua, if he could reveal to Peter that there was money in the mouth of a fish, close the lion's mouth for Daniel, part the Red Sea for Moses, open the prison for Peter and raise Lazarus from the dead. An impartial God, a good God, can certainly take care of you and me. Just have faith and trust God. Again, I say welcome, do be blessed, and have a happy Sabbath. Pastor Mel, I present to you our guests and church family. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Has God been good to you? Has God been a blessing? Are you happy to be in this place today? God is a good God. He provides what we need, when we need, when we need it. And we give him praise. We give him honor. We give him glory for what he's done. I'm going to ask everybody to stand now. And let's welcome each other to our church today. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms.
worship. What a joy divine. gotten your morning exercise in so you are ready to praise him because he's been worthy he's worthy worthy of our praise a couple of things and we're going to get right into our services i am excited about this next thing our senior citizens are very interested in praying for our young people and they are very desirous of getting the names of young people that they can pray for and lift up before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So today I have some cards. If you have a young person uh, that's in school, that's in college, and you want them to be prayed for consistently, we have our senior citizens that want to take these names and they want to present them to the Lord in prayer. So any mother, father, grandmother, grandmother who wants to take one of these cards, put the name of your child on there so that we'll make sure we can get it to our, our um, young, our, our senior citizens. Ushers, come and help me. Let's get these cards. We're going to give these cards. Please, we need you to turn the cards in. When the offering plates come around, put the cards in the offering plate. 
with the name of uh, your child, your grandchild on it so that we can make sure that we are sharing this with our senior citizens who will on a consistent basis be praying for our young people. So please make sure you get a card, make sure that you uh, put those names on there, make sure you turn those names in. Here you go, Sister Langston. Make sure that you get those names in. You can put your, all the names on one card, because we'll, we'll, we'll pass that on to the senior citizen. Let's not forget the choir stand. I got some more up here, sis. Well, ask your neighbor for your pen. Or ask the other neighbor. I mean, ask all your neighbors. Even those that are in a different zip code, ask them as well. See, but our, our senior citizens are very serious and they want uh, to do ministry and they want to make sure that our young people are being covered with prayer and by prayer. So please, let's make sure that we turn those names back in so that when the offering plates come around, just put them into the offering plate along with your offering. Just put the cards there and we'll make sure that we get these to our senior citizens who will be praying for them. Amen. And this was, this was something that was initiated by our senior citizens. I received a call from a senior citizen and said, Pastor, we just want to do ministry. And this is one of the things that we want to do for our church. We want to pray for our young people. We want to make sure that we're covering them uh, with the blood of Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. So we're excited about that. We're excited that they just don't want to sit around in their retirement uh, years and just sit there doing nothing. But they want to make sure they're actively doing ministry for the Lord. And we're just so excited about that. Do you not know that this, is the, this year is the 125th year of Shiloh? Shiloh has been around for 125 years. Amen. Amen. And we are excited about God and what God has done for this church over the years. And it's by his grace that we are looking into seeing what we can do to celebrate the 125th year of Shiloh. So, so be listening very intently in the future we're going to bring some things to you as we prepare to celebrate this great accomplishment of this church, of being in this community for 125 years. We also, at the last business session, voted that we're going to go ahead and move forward in building the multi-purpose building across the street next to the Winston Center. And so we are looking forward to that as well. Uh, we're going to put together a program. It's going to be brought to you. And we're going to kick it off on the day that we celebrate the 125 years of our existence. So we're going to bring those two things together and make it one as we move forward in doing ministry for the Lord here in the city of Ocala. Don't forget... We're looking for everybody to stay, stick around after services, after this man of God preach a powerful sermon. We want you to come and eat with us. Woo, that was weak. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> y'all know y'all like eating here in Shiloh, so don't down sit there and act like y'all don't. Amen. 
But we are looking forward to the, fa the family get-together, the fellowship that we're going to have with each and every one of you. Please, please don't rush off. Stay around. Stick with us. Come and enjoy the meal uh, that has been prepared. Enjoy the fellowship and get to know somebody that you may not know that well. Speak to someone that may be a little different or a stranger to you to get to know them. Let's have a great fellowship. Let's have a wonderful meal. And I promise you, you're going to leave from this place today excited about what God has done and is going to do for us. Now, our meeting this afternoon, I believe, Gwen, is at 4. We're going to have it at 4 p.m. Also, uh, we'll have a quick elders meeting at 4 as well. We'll get that done so we can get in uh, to the meeting as well. So those things are going to happen today at 4 o'clock. So let's keep those in mind. So let's stick around for what's going to happen this day. We're excited about the movement of God in our church. We're excited about the movement of God in our community. And we are just looking forward to what God is going to do for us on this day. God bless you. God be with you as we worship him today in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we're so thankful again for this day. We thank you for life, for health, and for strength. We thank you for how you have kept us up to this point. Lord, we pray that you forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Put within us a clean heart and a right spirit. Lord, be with uh, Ella Epps and uh, Shakira Scott, Lord. But we invite thy Holy Spirit coming to miss these blessings we have. In Jesus' name, amen. I remain standing. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I will be reading Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all power in heaven and on earth is given to me. So go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have told you. You can be sure that I will be with you always. I will continue with you until the end of the world. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Remain standing for our opening song. Praise him. Everybody looks so nice out there this morning. We're going to sing together. Bless. 
prayer time now. I don't know what your week has been like. Don't know what the devil has been doing to you. But this I do know. We serve a God who hears and he answers prayers. And today he wants to answer your prayer. So I invite those who would like to come to the altar to come. Bring all your concerns here and lay them before this altar. again at the altar cause Lord we need you life hasn't been a bed of roses we've suffered some thorns this past week we've shed some tears we've gone through some pain our hearts have been broken. But we come, Lord, bringing it all to you. Because we know that all power is in your hands. And there's nothing too hard for you. So we bring ourselves. We need the forgiveness of sin. We need to be purified. We need to be made holy. So God, we lay ourselves at the altar. Take us just as we are. But Lord, clean us up. 
Make us whole. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and provide for our needs. But Lord, we also come to this altar bringing all of our concerns. There's a mother that has brought her children to the altar. She's asking you, Lord, to save them. She's asking you to rescue them. She's asking you, Lord, to step into their space and to change their situation to make them whole again. There's, oh God, a father who's come to this altar and he's bringing his family because he's concerned about his family. God, I'm asking you to step in to their lives. Bring, Lord, conviction. Bring, Lord, rest, rest, uh, reconciliation. Bring, Lord, peace to that home. May they find the family altar that will put them in the presence of Jesus and will bring strength to their family. Oh, God, hear and answer that husband, that father's prayer today. There's some children that have come to this altar because they're struggling. They're going through some hard things in life. The devil is on their track and trying his best to defeat them and destroy them. Well, Lord, we lift up those young people to before you and place them on your altar. Please, Lord, be a shield and a buckler for them. Be their strong tower. Give them, oh God, victory in their lives and allow them to experience the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And then, Lord, there's somebody who's come to this place facing financial difficulties, having trouble meeting all their expenses. God, I'm praying that you'll open up a way, open up the doors of heaven and pour into them, Lord, a blessing that they won't have room enough to receive. So today, Lord, straighten out that financial situation. Oh, there's somebody, Lord, who's come to the altar today, struggling with their health, dealing with a diagnosis that the doctor has given them, worried and concerned about the future. Well, God, there's healing in your hands. You got all power, Lord. There's nothing you cannot do. So, Lord, I'm praying that you'll reach down from glory. You'll touch their body. Take away that sickness. Take away that pain. Take away that illness. Give them your peace. Remember Epps, Lord. Epps needs you, Lord. Remember, Sister Scott, she needs you, Lord. Reach down from glory. Heal, Lord, and make whole. Oh, Lord, there's somebody who's come to this place because they're in the wilderness and in the darkness of sin. And they need to be changed today. They're coming because they're seeking Jesus. Help them to find the master today. Help them to find Jesus, oh God. Open up the mouth of the preacher, Lord, and Preach through him, Lord, that some lost soul will find the light of Jesus today. They'll be changed. They'll be made over again. They'll be made in the image of Jesus Christ. Help that lost soul. Help them, oh God, to come home and to find Jesus. So, Lord, use the man of God today. Take away, Lord, all human things and let your divine presence be felt in the house today. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for answering our prayer because we ask it in the holy name of Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. just had probably a couple of weeks ago we had the death and resurrection celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the song is Matthew 28 destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up
Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the families of Dimitri Rice as well as Josiah Moulton to come as we present them to the Lord today. All the family members I apologize. Demir, I apologize to you. Amen. Amen. We're waiting on you, Sister Munnellin. We're waiting on you. Now, come on, come on. Don't shake everybody's hand. You got to come on around now. Come on around. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. We are grateful, grateful to God for his many, many blessings and for the decision that these parents have made today to bring these little ones to give them back to God. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to ask God's presence in, our, in this place today. Father, we need you. Because this is a sacred moment. A decision made by these parents, oh God, to give back to you these little ones. Please, Father, accept them in the name of Jesus, who when he was on the blessed earth, said to the disciples, suffer not, suffer not the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. Bring your kingdom down now, Lord, and accept these little ones in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Jennifer Zaria, right? Zaria and De Deontay. One out of three is not, yeah, two out of three is not bad. We, we, we want to applaud you for the decision you made today. But I want you to know that this decision today is not about them because they're not going to even remember what happened this day. You're going to have to remind them of what went down today. The decision you made today is about you as parents. You are actually presenting yourself to the Lord. You're actually giving yourself to him to raise these children in the admonition of Jesus Christ, to know him as their personal savior and friend. And God is expecting of you to bring them back to him. God is expecting of you to teach them about who he is, about his love, about his mercy, his grace. And I want to speak to you, Deontay, because everything your son will know about manhood 
He's going to learn from you. He's going to watch you. He's going to watch how you treat his mother. He's going to watch how you provide for the family. So everything that he learns about being a man, he's going to take from you. So I encourage you, be a man. Take care of your responsibility. Be a man. Never say anything in his presence nasty or degrading about his mother. Always keep her in his eyes as the queen and the one that everybody in the house respect. And what that will do in the long run, it will allow him to grow up and know how to treat women. He won't disrespect them because he never saw his dad or disrespect his mother. He will not call them out of their name because his daddy never called his mother out of her name. So everything you do as a man, he's going to learn and he's going to do. So it's very important that you live before him what a godly man is. And it's my pleasure. I believe it's in the blue bag. I want to give you, because I believe every, every person ought to be educated. And educating about children Growing up and raising children is a lifetime time in school. Amen. You're going to be forever learning and growing in being a parent. Because there never comes a time in your parenthood where you know it all. So I want to present this book to you today to help you in your education. It's called Keep Calm and Pray. Because he's going to challenge you. It's going to get a point in his life where he starts smelling himself. And he's going to challenge every word you say. And everything you tell him to do, he's going to ask why. And every direction you give him, he's going to ask why. You have to be calm. You got to pray and ask God to give you the right things to do. The right decisions to make so that he becomes the man that God wants him to be. To you ladies, it's important for you all to demonstrate to your sons how young men should treat young ladies. And it starts out by you not allowing them to dis disrespect you as mother. Never let your son say anything to you that's out of line or that's disrespectful. If he says something that you know is not correct, you need to correct him at that moment and say you don't speak to your mother that way. Matter of fact, you don't speak to any lady that way. And the way that he will treat other young girls and the way that he will treat other girls grown ladies is by the way you let him treat you. So make sure you don't allow him to disrespect you. Make sure that you don't allow him to speak words out of his mouth that will bring, that will put in his mind that that's all right to say to my mother. I'll never forget, we were living, I believe in Largo at the time. And we picked up our son from daycare. He had to be about two years old. And we're driving in the car. Then all of a sudden, my son just said a curse word. And I said, where in the world did he get that word from? And, 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 and so he said, I heard it in school. And we had to immediately correct him to let him know. Those type of words we don't say in this household. Those type of things we don't say. So as mama, make sure he doesn't say anything that will make him think it's all right to speak this way to you or to any other female. So it's very important if you want him to treat young ladies right, make sure he treats you right. That's where it starts at. Like I said, I got... Something for you as mama? Mm -hmm. That's fine. I want to hand you 
and it's called be cal keep calm. No, this that's not. Keep calm and trust God. Because you as mama got to realize little boys tra play tricks on mama. Little boys do things that uh, they think mama uh, won't discipline them for. So you as mama got to realize the little tricks that they're going to try to play on you and make sure you don't fall into them. You got to keep calm and you got to trust God. God will help you through it. God will make sure that you do the right things that would allow him to grow up, to know you and respect you as mama and to respect other females as well. Because if you want to make sure your child grow up and marry the right person, it's going to start with you making sure you instill in them principles that would allow them to know that these are the things you need to do as a young man to find the best young lady to bring home to mama and to daddy. So it's very important, very important. But one other thing that's very important God expects you all to teach them about Jesus. Probably the most important thing that I'm going to say to you today is this. Make sure you, get, uh, you teach them how to fall in love with Jesus. Because he's the only one that's going to really be able to protect them through life. You cannot be with them 24-7, but God can. You cannot protect them 24-7, but God can. Make sure you teach them to fall in love with Jesus. And I want to give you their first Bible so that you make sure you read to them the stories of Jesus. Read to them how much he loves them. Read to them how much he gave for them. Show them that God is a God who even listens to the prayers of children when they come to him. And I promise you, if you instill Jesus into their hearts, that Jesus will walk with them every day and he'll save them. That's his promise to each and every one of us. Now, I need to say something to all you other folk that are standing here. Because you're not standing here to look pretty. You're standing here either because you're grandparent, godparent, cousin, great-grandparent, that great-great-grandparent. Oh, that's why you're standing here. All right. I need you to hear me now. These are their children, not yours. So you let them raise their children the way they're going to raise their children. You can give advice. That's all right. Give a little advice here every now and then. But if they choose not to go with your advice, don't get mad. And don't try to force your will on them. And don't do things behind their backs that they wouldn't do. If they have a set law in their family about how they want to raise the child, you keep it that way, even if you don't agree with it. Because your job is to support. Your job is to pray. Your job is to be there. Let them raise their children the way they choose to raise it with between them and God. You just be grandparents and spoil them. Spoil them and then send them back home. Because believe me, the way you raise them you're not going to raise your grandchildren the same way. There are a lot of things that my mama let my son go get away with that she wouldn't let me get away with. See, and I didn't think that was fair, but that's life. See. <laughs> exactly. Get counseling later. Yes, exactly. But it's important that you allow them to raise 
their own children. Don't get in the way. Don't cause arguments. Don't cause confusion. Let them do it their way. You be there to support. You be there to pray. You be there and make sure that God is with them and that you're their biggest cheerleaders. I've asked my wife to join me here because I'm going to ask her to do a special prayer for the ladies that are here. Because being a mother is not an easy thing. It's a challenging thing. And every mother needs special strength from God and a special anointing from God in order to make it through these last and evil days. So I'm going to invite you all to just bow your heads where you are. As she presents these ladies to the Lord, and then I'm going to present Dante to the Lord, and then also I'll present these two young men to the Lord as well. Our kind, most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before thee first, asking for the forgiveness of sin, Lord, that there is nothing that will separate us from you or to keep this prayer from being heard. We thank you for this opportunity to present these families to you, specifically, Lord, the mothers. It is not an easy job to be a mom, so, Lord, we ask that they will learn today if not before, that you have all the answers. We just, they just have to ask you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Be with them as they go throughout every day, that they will begin to teach and learn and grow and develop their young men. We ask that you would bless them, encourage them, keep them, provide them with the things that they need, the things that they know they need and the things that they don't know, Lord. We ask that you would provide them with those things as well. We thank you for the grace that you provide for everyone daily. We ask you for your mercy. And Lord, we ask that you would give these ladies an extra dose of patience, an extra dose of love, an extra dose of forgiveness and kindness, because Lord, sometimes it's hard to forgive when those wonderful children have thrown up on that that dress that you got planned to wear to church. So, Lord, ask that help. we're asking them for forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would be with them in every decision that has to be made. We thank you. We praise you and save us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Lord, we are grateful that Jesus has come to be with us in this blessing. And I'm asking you, Lord, to remember Deontay. Give him, Lord, all the qualities that a Christian father needs in order to be able to raise his son in such a way that his son will look, grow to love and to know Jesus as well and that he'll become the young man that you want him to be. I also ask, Lord, that you remember in a very special way Josiah, that you'll lay his, your hands on him and allow him, oh God, to find that manly figure that he needs in order to learn what a man is all about and to find himself, God, learning the different things and the nuances of growing up and being the young man you would have him to be. I present these mothers to you as well, Lord, and ask that you'll continue to develop in them the graces that they need to teach their young men how to treat ladies and how to be respectful, and how to be one who never disrespects any young lady, but always be a gentleman. I present now, Lord, these two young men to you. Remember Demir and remember Josiah in a very special way. I pray, Lord, that you will take them into the palms of your hands. 
and that you, O oh God, will cover them and that you'll raise them in such a way, Lord, that when you call them by their name, they'll be willing to sacrifice their whole lives to you and become a part of your kingdom. We present them to you today in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may return to your seats. Let the church say amen. morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. You know, as, I, as the baby blessing was going on, I got excited because now I'm looking at possibly a third generation child that I would be teaching in Sabbath school Amen. in about six years. And I know some of the other teachers now, since I done brought that to your mind, you're going to be there too. At this time, it's time to receive our morning tithes and offering. Give the deacons a few more minutes here uh, before I pray. There's three ways that we can give. We can mail it to Shiloh SDA Church P.O. Box. 2643 Ocala, Florida, 34482. Uh, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the offering that we are about to receive, that it will further the work of the gospel in this general, in this part of the vineyard. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the other ways we can give is AdventistGiving.org. Market Shallow, Ocala, or we can drop it off. You can come on. You can drop it off at church at the Winston Center, Community Center, on Fridays between the hours of 9 and 2. God has been faithful to us, so he, so he wants us to be faithful to him in returning a tithe and offering. Thank you.
morning, Shalom. Happy Sabbath. All right, so I'm here to present our speaker for the morning, or for the day, afternoon. And um, it is none other than Pastor Lucius Hall. So Pastor Lucius Hall is a native of Georgia. After completing high school, he enlisted in the military services, the branch of the U.S. Army. Although he had accepted the Lord as his personal savior earlier in his life, it was while in the military that he agreed to conduct further research into the word of God. The Holy Spirit convicted him through Bible study. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit convicted him through Bible studies given to him by a friend, and as a result, he became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. After six years of serving his country, he accepted the call from God to serve him all the way. Now he must go, now he must go off and be officially trained for the gospel ministry. Pastor Hall is a product both of Oakwood University and the seminary of Andrews University. His academic preparation includes theological and social work training, pastoral education, and pastoral ministry. In 1987, Pastor Hall accepted the assignment from the Southeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists to serve as Associate Publishing Director. While serving in this capacity from 1988 until 1993, he held Revelation seminars and baptized many precious souls for Christ. It was, however, in 1993 that the Executive Committee of the Southeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists voted that he should assume pastoral duties and responsibilities in the Brunswick Waycross District of Georgia, where he pastored two congregations, the Berean and the Maranatha Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1995, he was transferred to the Avon Park Bartow District, where he served the Ridge Area and Ebenezer SDA churches for five years. Um, while in this tenure, a third congregation was organized known as the All Nations Seventh-day Adventist Church in Winter Haven, Florida. And this is where I had the opportunity to meet Pastor Hall. It was 1997. My mom and I migrated from New York and we became members of the All Nations Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I know Pastor Hall very well. Um, <laughs> I know him so well that he was the pastor that officiated our wedding, Leroy. And not only that, on that day, he became my father-in-law. So <laughs> Pastor Hall and Sister Hall, Dr. Hall, his wife, and I can personally, like, affectionately call him Pops. <laughs> Our children can call him Granddad, but officially Pastor Hall. Um, so it was here in uh, Winter Haven that he also founded and served as speaker director of the Voice of Hope radio broadcast that was heard on three stations across Central Florida and later in South Florida area. God has used the Voice of Hope radio broadcast in a tremendous way to reach souls beyond the walls of the church. After being transferred to South Florida area, Pastor Hall was able to lead for several, with an able leader for several churches there, including Mount Pisgah, First Ephesus, Bethel, Mission Station, Southernmost, Ebenezer, and Mount Olivet. Under his leadership, something significant became a reality. It was there, it was the long-awaited, uh, I guess, bringing together that formed the Bethel Elementary School. So Bethel Elementary School was subsequently organized for which there was a grand celebration. After serving in the South Florida District for many years, Pastor Hall transitioned north where he served as the senior pastor of the Poinciana Seventh-day Adventist Church in Kissimmee, Florida, 
and Bethel SDA Church in Cocoa, Florida, um, in that district from 2019 to 2022. While in this district, he founded the Addiction and Recovery Program at the Poinciana Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Hall is married to the former Betsy May Hall, or excuse me, Betsy May Benjamin of Manchester, Jamaica. My mother-in-law, she sits over here. She can stand if she would like, or maybe, yeah, you can stand if you like. All right. And Pastor and Dr. Hall are blessed parents and grateful grandparents, as well as great grandparents. Pastor Hall has currently been serving as the publishing director since April 2022 to the present at the Southeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. One of Pastor Hall's favorite texts is found in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, and it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This passionate, visionary, dedicated, and faithful servant of God has allowed the Holy Spirit to use him in the past, and today will be no exception. After the special music of meditation, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Pastor Lucius Hall. Thank you, and be blessed.
Let's give the choir another hearty amen. You know, you're blessed here at Shallow, and I'll tell you one of the reasons why you're blessed. There are several. But one of the reasons is it's getting hard to find church choirs. Y'all didn't say amen on that one. I grew up in the Baptist tradition where we had some great choirs. You used to even sing in the choir. And there's something special about church choirs, amen? And I understand we done got all sophisticated and we have, you know, what we call these praise teams. But there is nothing like a church choir in the strong African-American tradition. Those church choirs are powerful. And so let's give our hands, uh, put our hands together again for the church choir. I want to thank Doc Mills for the opportunity to stand in his pulpit, uh, classmate, and I believe if my memory is correct, I'm a senior citizen now, you see you're younger than I am, but I believe we were hired the same year, amen? I believe it was the same executive committee that brought both of us on, me and publishing and you and pastoral ministry. And here we are, 30 some years later, but you are younger than I am, amen? So we salute uh, your pastor. We salute uh, the first lady of this congregation as well. Now, I have the ability and the audacity uh, to meddle a little bit before I get into this message. Amen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to greet you on behalf of the conference. I'm going to do all of that. But the first question that I want to ask Shiloh, are you taking care of your first family? I heard one amen here, another amen over there. So let me ask the question again. I'm going to rewind the tape. Are you taking care of your first family? Amen. That's a little, little better. Now, I'm going to tell you what I mean when I say taking care of your church family, your first family, your pastoral family. It means that when the pastor has a birthday, you remember that birthday. Amen. You got a little quiet there now. So let me try that one again. When the pastor has a birthday, you remember the pastor's birthday. Amen. You also remember the first lady's birthday. You remember their son's birthday, amen? You remember their anniversary, their wedding anniversary. Let me tell you the reason why I say that, because so often in too many churches, we want the pastor and his family to be there for us and for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, and we wear them out. But we never think that sometimes they need to be refreshed a little bit. I told you I was going to meddle for just a minute. So it's nothing wrong with taking them out for lunch and for dinner. There's nothing wrong with recognizing birthday. I see nowhere in my church manual where you cannot, in essence, make sure that the first family of the church is taken care of. Because when you take care of the first family, this is my commercial now, they will make sure that they take care of you as well. Amen? Don't beat them down. Don't beat them up. Too many of our pastors got too many stressful situations already. Amen? So don't be on the devil's side. Make sure that you take care of the first family. Amen? Of your local congregation. I know that because my dad served for so many years as a member of the deacon board of the Baptist church where I grew up. And one thing was clear. He made sure that the pastor was taken care of in the sense that he took care of the various responsibilities of the church, amen, and worked very closely with the pastor. And I've told people through the years, I could never be a pastor fighter because I saw a positive example from my father as to how you relate to your pastor and even to the pastor's family, amen? Now, I am also grateful for the work in publishing that Shiloh has done through the years. I see none other than the great Dr. Patrick Hadley. Patrick, would you please stand, please, sir? Anybody that can sell $30,000 worth of peanuts, boiled peanuts in one year, he's a tremendous salesman, amen? But, but back in the 80s, he was one of the persons that, that served. Uh, Leo and Gwen, I would stop off at their house in addition to them selling books. Uh, that was a place where I knew that if I was hungry, I could find a meal, amen? And then I was stopped by uh, Brother Jimmy's house as, as well and be able to uh, fellowship there. Um, Jonathan Simmons and his wife, Undine, they were some of the powerful 
a literature evangelist back in the day. This was one of the hubs, this local church, where some powerful ministry took place for this community in the area of literature ministry. Amen? And so we uh, would love to see that happen again. I'm thankful that my wife is traveling with me uh, today. She's often connected in the hospital setting, but uh, we're delighted that she's traveling with me here today. And normally when you are working with the conference, uh, you know, you normally give those greetings. So I want to greet you on behalf of the conference president, Dr. Michael Awusu, on behalf of Pastor Pierre, and on behalf of the CFO, Elder Charles. Amen. And on behalf of the other team members that helped to make up the Southeastern Conference, I greet you. I uh, will say more. I want to get into the message because I know some of you, you already got your watches looking because they said food. And so I know that some of you are already looking for some physical food. Amen. But we want to take a moment to provide the spiritual food. This is publishing day. And we are delighted that the pulpit has been open and this church has been open to be able to promote the publishing ministry of our conference. I will say one thing and say a little bit more later on. I'm thankful for Southeastern Conference that they still have, we still have a publishing ministry. We have a number of black conferences across North American Division that have shut down their publishing program. Literally, there are only two remaining publishing programs in the regional conferences of North America. That's Southeastern Conference and South Central Conference. The rest of our uh, publishing departments for the various black conferences have closed down their programs. And I've asked the question is, are they reading the spirit of prophecy? Because if I understand the spirit of prophecy correctly, publishing is going to still be standing in the last days. Amen? And so I'm delighted that this church um, has opened its doors. I want you to stand with me, if you will, for the reading of the word. I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, as we open the word of God. I want to look at those first three verses there of Revelation chapter 7. And the Bible declares... In Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, that after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2 says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have done something, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Our Father, as we open your word, we simply ask now that the Helper will come, which is the Holy Spirit, to bless us as we stand in need of your blessings, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I also uh, want to thank Sister Scott for all that she has done through the years, still continuing the legacy of her husband, Leo, who was a great publishing leader for this local church. Amen. So we want to thank her for what she has continued to do. June 1 through November 30th is officially hurricane season. And if you live in South Florida, or you've ever lived in South Florida at any point in time, you will understand that South Florida is a hurricane belt. You'll also understand that living in South Florida, you have to make sure that you are prepared on short notice for a hurricane that could strike on very short notice. Those waters begin to warm up somewhere uh, early or uh, late May into the early parts of June. And some of those waters that began to warm up ultimately ends up into what becomes hurricanes. My family and I lived for 19 years and pastored about three districts and seven churches down in South Florida. There is one thing 
that you want to make sure that you do, and that is make sure that you get out of the way of a hurricane when a hurricane is passing through. But there are some folks that I don't understand. I mean, they're just, for some of us, we would call them crazy. But there are some folks called hurricane hunters that when it is determined that a hurricane is forming or has already formed, they get in these planes that are specially made by the United States Air Force. They fly into the midst of what's called the eye of a hurricane. Now, the eye of the hurricane is where there's supposed to be a calmness there. And once they fly into the midst of that hurricane, then what they do, they will drop a weather balloon. That weather balloon then picks up various kinds of things coming from information, as it were, coming from that hurricane. One of the things that 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 weather balloon will pick up is which direction that hurricane is going in. That becomes critical because when those hurricanes become category four, category five hurricanes, and even category three, they are killer storms. And in some cases, in those low-lying areas, you need to get out of the way of those bad boys. Amen? So when that hurricane balloon or that balloon is dropped, it sends back to the hurricane center in Miami the direction and not only the direction, but how strong that storm is. Then the meteorologist department there in Miami, what they then do is start making some determinations as that storm gets stronger. They look at the direction. They look at the strength of that storm, and they either do one or two things. They either issue a warning or a watch. A watch says to them that there's a possibility that this hurricane could get stronger and it could head in your direction. But a warning says that a hurricane has been spotted, it is growing in strength, and in essence, you've got literally 36 hours to prepare yourself. Now, those 36 hours, you need to make sure that you've got medication if you're on medication. You need to make sure that your phones are charged up, that there's gas in your vehicle. You need to make sure that your windows are protected. You need to make sure that your animals, if you've got animals that you know where the animal shelter is, that shelters those animals. You need to make sure that there's water to drink for three days, water for use of, or usage in other areas. You need to make sure that those things are taken care of. You've got 36 hours to do that. In the midst of that storm, though, there is a deceptive calm. Sometimes the, the, the calmness is, is so calm there that it can really say, make you say to yourself, I don't have to worry about this storm because, after all, it's calm. It's going to pass over. That's what happened in, 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 in the 80s when Hurricane Andrew passed by. Many folks said, well, Hurricane Andrew is going to pass by South Florida. It's going to pass by Homestead. It's going to pass by Florida City. But at the last moment, Hurricane Andrew made a sharp turn, and when it made a sharp turn, it devastated South Florida, especially Homestead and the Florida City area. Many died, and multi-million dollars worth of damage was caused. Heaven has issued a hurricane warning. I said, Her heaven has issued a hurricane warning. That hurricane warning is found in Revelation chapter 7. And in Revelation chapter 7, this old man, this prophet, if you please, last surviving disciple of Jesus, on the Isle of Patmos, God shows to him this vision. And in Revelation chapter 7, he in essence says that a storm is coming. Are y'all still with me out there, Shallow? There's a storm that is coming. And if you haven't heard the title of this message, let me give it to you. And the title is a, of the message is, A Calm Before the Storm. There is a hurricane, of, of, of hurricane proportion, or I should say a storm of hurricane proportion that is getting ready to hit this planet. But you say, wait a minute, preacher. 
I thought we were already in a storm when we look at what's happening to this planet right now. With the mass shootings and the high divorce rate and juvenile delinquencies and earthquakes one after another and tornadoes and storms and all of the other things and wars and rumors of wars. I thought that we were already in a storm. But somebody said you ain't seen nothing yet, amen? Because Revelation 7 says that after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding back the wind. In other words, whatever could happen right now, God is holding back things for just a little bit longer. Because the reality of it is, he knows that there's a whole lot of folks that's not ready yet. He knows that he's got to get some other people ready because the storm is getting ready to come. He knows that even in the church, some folks got one foot in the world and the other foot in the church. He knows that right now there's a lukewarm church. But when a hurricane, as we already said, when a hurricane is spotted, the bottom line is, it's time for preparation. And the bottom line is, I want you to understand that in spite of what others are saying, if Jesus is still coming. Uh, let me rewind the tape on that one. Jesus is still coming. The very fact that we are Seventh-day Adventists, our very name said that we believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, now, some Adventists are living like there is no tomorrow. They're living like Jesus is not coming again, amen? But I stopped by here to tell you, Jesus is coming, and his coming is near even at the door. Now, during the calm, we're going to see all kind of crazy stuff going on. We're going to see a secular, a secular society, and the bottom line is, Somebody said, in essence, that the reason why there are so many atheists is because the atheists have looked at the Christian and said, if this is what Christianity is all about, we want nothing to do with it. There's going to be a sex-centered society where sex is going to sell everything. Thrill-seeking, a morally bankrupt society. We have reached that point right now where we live in a morally bankrupt society. We live in a time where even from the pulpit, the bottom line is these pulpits across America, many of them don't have the power that they used to have. There was a time in essence, brothers and sisters, where whether you met on a Sabbath morning or a Sunday morning, preachers stood in these pulpits and they preached the word of God. But the reality of it is now in too many churches, we've got pimps standing in the pulpit. And some of them, you know the alphabets. Some of them pastor mega churches. And they're hanging out. They're hanging out with rappers. Now, I'm not going to call any names. But they're hanging out with rappers. Amen. Now, maybe they are hanging out with the rappers in order to try to get the rappers converted, amen? But you can't engage in what the rappers are doing if you're trying to get them converted. Y'all with me out there? Thrill-seeking, morally bankrupt, sports madness, amen? I said sports madness. Before the storm a godless society is going to exist, a society that is concerned only about satisfying the flesh. Mass shooting, fatherless homes, runaway divorce rates, breakdown of the family. Amen? And then a gender identity crisis. I'm going to clear my throat on that one. <clears> throat> Last time I checked, Pastor Mel, you were still a male. But could you imagine one day Pastor Mel standing in this pulpit and say, I'm no longer a male, I am now a female. Now, first of all, his wife would say, boy, you need some real serious counseling. and You're going to need to sit on my couch. But we have reached that point in history. 
And the reason why I know that God's got to come because God made male and female. I was in South Florida standing in a post office. And I saw a human being walk in the post office. It wasn't a dog. It wasn't a cat. It was a human being. But the problem that I had was trying to figure out if it was a male or a female. We have reached the point where in our society now it's getting hard to determine who is male and who's female, but it's still the calm before the storm. Massive technological inventions, wars and rumors of wars, floods, earthquakes, fire, disease, massive technology. Let me start with technology. How many of you have cell phones? Hold up your cell phones. Let me see your cell phones. Hold them up. Thank you, Doc. How many of you have cell phones? Let me see your cell phones. All right. Now, let me ask a strange question. How many of you do not own a cell phone? Let me see your hand. Anybody? Okay, I see some of the kids. Some of the kids said, no, we don't own a cell phone. Not, not yet. <laughs> here, here is where the problem is, y'all. The problem is that them cell phones done messed us up. <clears throat> I said them cell phones done messed us up. Let me repeat that again. Them cell phones that messed us up because we are spending more time on these electric gadgets than we are the word of God. We on Facebook and Instagram and we on TikTok and this talk and that talk and every other talk. And we telling people, I'm eating here and I'm going there and I'm on that vacation. And I say, how crazy can you be? Because you are signaling to criminals where you are and they're able sometimes to track your situation and break into your house. Some years ago, one of our communication directors said that a young lady put up some information online. And one day, with just a tad bit of information, there's a knock on her door. And a detective stood at her door and asked her parents, does such and such person live here? And they said, yes. He identified himself as a police detective and said that your daughter, with the little information that she put up on her Facebook or wherever it was, I was able to track without having her address and other information exactly where she lived. Now, if I could do that, what if a criminal element that meant her harm wanted to do that as well? Amen? Stay with me. Because this massive technology is good, but it's also bad. Amen? It's bad because... Some of y'all as parents are letting these, this technology raise your children. A colleague and, and, and myself were talking the other day. And when I went to school, we were bullied. Amen. But we're still sane. We're not mentally ill. But the reality of it is... A lot of these children today are saying that we've got a mental health crisis because of the fact that we are being bullied. Amen? But technology is one of the inventions that is good, 
but it is also bad. But it is to come just before the storm. Now, just before the storm, there's going to be three groups of people. Those that love God, those that hate God, and those that, in essence, are trying to figure out what is truth and what is error. But stay with me. Look back with me in Revelation. Because in Revelation chapter 7, the Bible says here that there's going to be a process, a sealing process that will begin to take place just before the storm breaks. There's going to still be radio for a little bit, TV, social media, all of those things. And right now, the Adventist church, we use radio. We use television. We use social media. But if I was the devil, I would shut down social media before probation closes. I was on my way home one evening while I lived in South Florida. I was near a small airport. I was talking on the phone near the airport when all of a sudden there was this loud banging noise that came from my phone and my phone went dead, completely dead, silent. This noise hurt my ear. In fact, I had that phone to my right ear. I'm driving. So I drove heading on home and within a few minutes, my phone rung again. And I answered the phone. And on the other end of the phone, a gentleman simply asked me, are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm okay. And then I put two and two together. Evidently, somebody in that tower that talks to those pilots that are landing and taking off, someone had the ability to jam the cell phone signal that was going to my cell phone. Now, if they're able to do that just before probation closes, just before the storm, there is going to be, in essence, a censorship of the media that we now enjoy. If you don't believe it, ask the most recent president if they're not able to censor what you put up on the media, and he's one of the former president. Ask President Donald Trump, former president, amen? Media is able to be controlled by our military, amen? They're able to control it, and there will be, and there is already a certain control of our media as we know it. Stay with me for just a moment. Just prior to Jesus coming, if I was the devil, I would close down our radio media and our TV media and all of the other medias that has anything to do with Jesus Christ. But one thing that cannot be closed down is the printed page. How do you know that, preacher? They tried it during the dark ages, and it didn't work. They tried it during the time of the Waldenses, and it didn't work. They burned Bibles. They burned books. But the more they burned, the more the Christians who went underground, they were able to find a way to print. And if I'm understanding, in the last days, just prior to the coming of the Lord, just before probation closes, they are going to make an attempt to close down even the printed page, but they will not be successful. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that one of the things that will still be standing in ministry will be the printed page. The printed page was here 
before our church got its name. The printed page will still be here to help usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. When media is closed down, when, when radio is censured and all of the other avenues of public media, the printed page is going to stand. But the question is, how is it that the printed page will help finish the preaching of the gospel? The answer is simple. Literature evangelists will go forth. Church members will go forth. And by the tens of millions, by the hundreds of millions, these books are going to be placed in homes. And as these books are placed in homes, when probation is about to close, people are going to take these books and pamphlets. They're going to take them off their shelves. And as they take them off their shelves, they are going to begin to read. And multitudes are going to read their way into the truth of God's word. There's a debate that is going on right now. And the debate is, why do we still need the publishing ministry? Why do we need publishing? Well, the answer is because publishing will help finish the work of God to help usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some say, well, we have, you know, all of this other media we have Facebook and Instagram, and we have all of this other technology, and we have online abilities to do a whole lot of stuff online. But you know the strangest thing? With all of this modern-day online technology, people still love to pick up a good book and read it. I'm traveling sometime, and I'm looking over on airplanes and trains, and I'm seeing people take a book. I'm seeing computers and people on computers and iPads and phones, but I'm also seeing individuals that are picking up a paperback book, and they're reading these books as well. These books are not going to go anywhere. They're going to be around until the second coming of Jesus Christ because this is a ministry that has been ordained by God himself. So let me ask you the question. How then will the publishing ministry help finish the work of God? Because we have great preachers and great pastors and great evangelists. So how then will the publishing ministry help finish the work of God? Right here in Ocala, multitudes of pieces of literature, books after book after book after book has gone into homes. And one of these days, what's going to happen as the time of trouble begins to approach and people begin to see that something spectacular is about to happen on this earth, they're going to begin to pick up their books. Those books that have gone into the homes by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the millions, all across North America and in other foreign lands where literature evangelists are working, these books are going to go into homes. And one of these days, people are going to begin to pull these books from the shelves. And when they pull these books from the shelves, they're going to begin to read. Well, you say, preacher, well, how do you know that? How do you know that that's going to happen? I know that because in my ministry, it has happened. And let me tell you how it happened. One Sunday morning, I was on the radio in Winter Haven, and I had preached a sermon on the Sabbath. I was doing a series on the Sabbath, amen? And y'all got to forgive my voice a little bit, but the devil does not want this message to be preached this morning, and I'm having a little hoarseness this morning. Stay, stay with me for a minute. So I'm preaching that Sabbath, uh, that Sunday morning, and at the end of that broadcast, I would have people call in. So the phone rung, and they said, Pastor Hall, there's a lady on the other line that wants to talk to you. And when I picked up the phone, this lady, who's a good Sunday keeper, was talking to me on the other line, and she basically talked to me a little bit about the message that I had preached. And so we had prayer. 
and I hung up the phone. The next Sunday, I continued my series on the Sabbath. That same lady called back again, and I talked with her a little bit. And she said, Pastor, she said, let me be honest with you. She said, when I called you that first Sunday, I had planned to call you and tell you that if y'all Seventh-day Adventists want to keep that Sabbath, y'all keep that Sabbath and leave us Sunday folks alone. She said, that's what I wanted to tell you. But she said, I could not bring myself to tell you that. The Holy Ghost held my tongue. And she said, at the end of the day, I and you, we had prayer together. But she said something. She asked me the question, where is your church? And I said, it's an all-nation Seventh Adventist church in Winter Haven. She said, I tell you what, I think I'm coming to your church. But she said, I can tell you something else. She said, I can tell you, I think I'm going to join your church. Now, now, wait a minute, Shallow. Let me tell you what happened between that Sunday and the Sunday after. When she called me the first time and told me that she wanted to give me a piece of her mind. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need all of my mind. Amen. That sister said, I'm going to tell you something, Pastor, what happened to me. She said, I was studying, and, and let me tell you something. These first day folks, don't you underestimate them because they're studying their word. She said, I was at home when I talked to you that first Sunday. She said, I was studying my word. And she said, I got up to do something. And she said that wherever I had stopped, she said, I took my Bible and I turned my Bible face down. She said, I did what I had to do. And then she said, I came back to finish where I was studying. And she said, I turned my Bible right side up. And she said, when I turned my Bible right side up, she said, my Bible, the pages of my Bible turned to a study on the Sabbath. No, 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 wait a minute now. Where did that Bible with a study on the Sabbath come from? I'll tell you where it came from. A literature evangelist sold her that Bible. A literature evangelist with them Bible study helps in the back. And with those Bible study helps in the back, she said that Bible flipped open to a study on the Sabbath. And she said, I cried out, God, what are you doing to me? Because she knew that she had just had a conversation with me and she wanted to tell me or give me a piece of her mind. That lady came to church just as she promised. And when the appeal was made, Doc Mel, she walked down the center aisle. And when she walked down the center aisle, brothers and sisters, that lady became a baptized member of the Winter Haven All Nation Seventh day Adventist Church. But you know where it started? It started when a literature evangelist sold that Bible, and she took that Bible down off of her shelf, and when she opened that Bible, she opened it eventually, and it fell open to a study on the Sabbath. And just like that happened, it's going to happen many times over here in America. It was 1999. As someone gets ready to play for me, it was 1999. A literature evangelist had gone to a church and a literature evangelist had sold some books. And the headline in 1999 says that St. Thomas has become a Seventh-day Adventist. St. Thomas. If you know anything about St. Thomas, St. Thomas lived a a long time before 1999. But what had happened is a literature evangelist had sold some books, and those books were put into the library of the church, and that church for a number of years allowed those books to remain in its library. It was in Mexico. And that literature evangelist that, that had sold those books probably had long forgotten about those books that he had put in the church library. The church leadership read those books that the literature evangelists had delivered, but they made no change. And then along comes Pope Paul 
the second. You remember him. We remember him. Fifteen years later, Pope Paul the second challenged the world to go back to the keeping of Sunday. You remember that. And the church leadership started scratching their head and they said, wait a minute. Didn't we just read about some things about how the Catholic church will have influence concerning Sunday worship? They call for a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church to come and they say, come, we need some Bible studies. The member of the church, of the Adventist church, called for their pastor. And the pastor came. And then the pastor called for an evangelist, and an evangelist came. And they ran an evangelistic meeting in that area. And some of the members of that church became Seventh-day Adventists. And then other members of that congregation became Seventh-day Adventists. And other members of that congregation became Seventh-day Adventists. Until the majority of that congregation became Seventh-day Adventists. Why? Because of books that were left by a literature evangelist, many perhaps long forgotten, but somebody one day reached on the shelves of that church library and started pulling those books down and started reading when they saw the headlines. And that's what's going to happen with the publishing ministry in North America and the publishing ministry all across various parts of the world and our other divisions of the world. There are literature evangelists that are going door to door. They, they, they have student programs like what we have here in North America and they're putting books in homes, books here and books there and magazines here and magazines there. And one of these days, as probation begins to rapidly move towards the close. Folks are going to start pulling down these books off of the shelf and they're going to start reading and multitudes are going to read their way into the truth. But the job of the publishing ministry is to get the books into the home. Oh, they're going to try to burn some books and destroy some books, but they will not be able to destroy all of them. Ask China. China has already tried to do it. Ask Russia. Ask these communist countries that the more Bibles they burn and the more books they burn, they were not able to burn all of them. These books and Bible and the word of God will survive. But something has happened here to us in North America. At one time, North America, we had strong literature, ministry, programs in North America before a pastor would even lift a finger to run an evangelistic meeting they would get in touch with literature ministry Ella Lewis you know that you're a veteran pastor our pastors would call in the publishing ministry and say, look, we need some literature evangelists to break up this territory and work this area and go door to door. I know because I did it in Jacksonville, Florida in the 80s when the breath of life, then C.D. Brooks as the speaker director with Reginald Robinson as the associate pastor and, and speaker and director. They asked the literature evangelists to go into Jacksonville, the east side of Jacksonville, and work Jacksonville because they were getting ready to plant a church there. The pastor at that time said, Doc Hall, we need you. We need y'all in that area. And that area was worked. Breath of Life came in, and a church was organized on the east side of Jacksonville called the Breath of Life. There was a time with the literature evangelists, like the Marine Corps, they would be the first on the front line, followed by the Bible workers, and they would get what we call interest that was turned over to the Bible workers. The Bible workers would then work, though, and we had tremendous baptisms. But if I was the devil, I would say to us, y'all have gotten too sophisticated. 
I mean, y'all got all this technological stuff now. You don't need all that publishing stuff anymore. Shut it down. And that's exactly what some of our leadership have done across North America. They have shut down these publishing houses. In fact, we've even lost one of our major publishing houses that came out of the turn of the 19th century called Review and Herald. We have one major, major publishing house in North America, one major house, and you know what that is. That's the Pacific Press, Boise, Idaho. But the reality of it is, there is a blueprint, and if we get back to it, brothers and sisters, we're going to see these pews begin to fill up. We've got to get back into the streets. That's where our parents came from, and our grandparents, and our great-grandparents, they took the streets for Jesus. But we got to take the streets back from the Jehovah Witnesses. Because the Jehovah Witnesses now have taken over our communities. And when we go to doors, many times we're thought of as Jehovah Witnesses. But it's the calm before the storm. Storm is getting ready to break up on this earth right now. A storm, a time of trouble such as we have never known before. And God in his grace and his mercy before the storm strikes, he is giving us just a little bit more opportunity. Just a little more. And so today I want to make several appeals. My first appeal is that if you are here today, and you are not a baptized member of the Seventh Adventist denomination. But you want to know more. You want Bible studies. And after Bible studies, you will make a decision to make sure that when Jesus comes, your calling and election is made sure with Jesus. If that is your desire, I'm going to ask you just to stand right where you are. I need Bible studies. And after Bible studies, I will make that decision to become a baptized member. If you're here today, well, why don't you just stand right where you are? Or maybe you once walked with God, but you have backslidden. And it is the calm just before the storm. And you know that God, I need to come home before it's too late. If you're here, if that's your desire, I'm asking you just to stand right where you are today. I want to rededicate myself to you, God. I want to go back to the watery grave of baptism. If that's your desire today, I'm going to ask you just to stand right where you are right now. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The stillness of these moments. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another? I want to go back to the watery grave of baptism to rededicate, to recommit my life to you, God. Time is short. The Lord is coming soon. What we're looking at right now is the deterioration of all that we've known to be good right now on planet Earth. It's a great deterioration that is happening. There's a moral bankruptcy. Jesus is to come soon. The love of many are waxing cold. God is soon to come. Is there another? In these closing moments, quickly, if you will stand. Lord, I need to go back to the watery grave of baptism, recommit my life to you. Is there another that will stand? Quickly. I'm going to ask now the ushers if they will put into the hands of every person that is here. There are some other appeal cards that we have relating to publishing. We have students that come out to these various communities and they need places to stay for sometime a few weeks at the time. And God bless you, my sister. I believe someone will get your information. Amen. Thank you for standing. There are students that need places to stay. There are those that need transportation to, to help assist us with getting students around with transportation. On this card that is going to be placed in your hands, 
We're going to ask that you will print your name, your address, your phone number. And however you feel that God impresses you to support the publishing ministry of this conference, which in essence is supporting your local church. Because any contacts that we get at the office from your area, we turn them over to the local church to be followed up with Bible studies and ultimately baptism. But there's a number of things. We're looking for full-time workers. Full-time. And the full-time workers are considered missionaries to the full extent. We're looking for those who will be part-time. We're looking for those who will be student literature evangelists. You have a school next door. And we'll say more about that. We're looking for those who will pray daily for the publishing ministry. If that is your desire, we're going to ask you just to check off on that. We're looking for those who will donate, whether that's $5, $1, $2, that will donate their churches now, believe it or not, where they have an active publishing ministry, but they cannot afford the literature. And they call our conference office, the publishing department, and they say, look, Pastor, we need literature. We have people that are going out, but we don't even have a budget large enough to be able to afford the literature. And so in, in some cases, we're able to give literature that others have been able to donate to. And then becoming a part of a weekly, and I'm going to deal with this one later, becoming a part of a weekly outreach literature team. Well, at least once a week, you go on, go into the community and use literature in order to try to gain contacts or interest for your local church, for Bible studies and for baptism. If that's your desire, check that. We mentioned housing, transportation. If there's other things that you can do that you feel that can be a blessing to the publishing ministry, check it off, if you will. And at the door... The ushers will be there to collect these cards, and we will be in contact with you. Amen? Let's stand now as we, we pray the close. Our Father and our God, Father, we thank you for the publishing ministry before our church had a name, the publishing ministry existed. The publishing ministry from the 19th century became a powerful tool and still is a powerful tool, even in the midst of technology, to win souls. Now, God, we pray that you will bless as these cars are being filled out we pray that, dear God, from this local church, that a team will be put together to go out on a weekly basis to reach this community with a printed page that will complement the preached word from this pulpit on a weekly basis. We pray, dear God, that you will lay it upon the hearts of those who are gathered here today or maybe those who listen or view by line or online, we pray that a team will go out every week and that, dear God, they will reach souls in this area of the vineyard through the printed page and that through the medium of the printed page, multitudes will come into the ark of safety before it's everlastingly too late. Now, Father, we thank you for a dear sister that stood in rededication and recommitment of her life to you. And we pray this day, this day, dear God, that you will continue to bless the shallow Seventh Adventist Church in this area of the vineyard that you are planted here. May it continue to be a lighthouse in this community. And may it, Lord, grow stronger with the passing of each day. Bless the leadership. Pastor Mills and his wife, the board of elders, the church board, the membership that makes up this church. May you use this church, dear God, 
to help hasten your soon coming in this area of the vineyard is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand for our closing hymn, which is found in your bulletins. I'm on the battlefield. We're going to sing um, just the first verse of I'm on the battlefield, found in your bulletins. I am on the battlefield. promise him that I oh I am on the battlefield for my Lord one more time I'm on the battlefield the battlefield for my Lord I am on the battlefield for my Lord and I promise him Oh, I will serve him till I die. I am on. Well, I was alone and idle. Well, I was alone. And I was a sinner too. And I heard the voice from heaven. Saying there is work. So I took my master's hand. And joined the Christian band. Join the Christian band. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield. Oh, and I promise him that I, I will serve. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all from this day forth and forevermore until we see him coming in the clouds of glory to pick up his children. May you hold firm and may you stand until the day our Lord shall come in Jesus' name. Amen.